Uh, hello, I'd um, just like to say, first of all, thank you to the Tate and to the organisers um, for doing this. Uh, it's been incredibly revealing and uh, thanks so much to Fast Forward and, and the Tate for you know, providing us with this opportunity and for inviting me to contribute. Um, so the, the title of my presentation is States of Colour, Irish and Vietnamese Women after Albert Kahn's Archives of the Planet. <clears throat> In 1913, Marguerite Mespillet and Madeleine Mignon Alba visited Ireland to make the first colour photographs of Ireland and its people. These two photographers were the only female photographers to create images for Albert Kahn as part of his worldwide project, The Archives of the Planet. Significantly, <clears throat> Sorry. Significantly, at a time when women's freedoms were limited, Cannes Archive represents the works of these two female photographers, as well as providing us with an image of women from the Americas, Europe, Asia and Africa between 1909 and the early 1930s. <clears throat> Taken just a few years before the 1916 Rising and the subsequent foundation of the Irish state, the images of Irish women introduce us to the complex and often contradictory role of women within Irish society at this time. Approximately 220 women took part in the Rising. The proclamation of the Republic, read out on Easter Monday 1916, reveals the movement's radical inclusion of women and its endorsement of equality for women. Mespule and Mignon, colours, colour images from the west of Ireland, reveal the direct character of women within Irish society at this time. They provide a clue to the dynamism of the 1916 Rising, which culminated in the unification of the struggles for national independence, women's equality and labour, and the cultural revival movement. The role of colour in these photographs reveals a vibrancy of character, a fierceness which suggests the women's role in society, their independence as characters, and not simply as elements within a landscape. This kind of focus and identification of character has been mostly absent within black and white photographic representations of poor rural women and fails to depict the role of aesthetics in, in lifting the human spirit above poverty and oppression. Mespillet's images provide a platform from which to explore Ireland's historic relationship to culture as a revolutionary force. In 1915, Leon Boussy, a French officer serving in Indochina, created images of Vietnam and in particular women of Vietnam for Cannes Archive. In contrast to the images of Irish women taken by Mespillet and Mignon, these images have been described in various places as purient, vulgar, voyeuristic, colonialist and invasive. There is a complex web of relationships to be explored here with a colonised female body at its centre where the images of Vietnam appear to be an attempt to appropriate the native and constructor image, the images taken in Ireland seem to allow the photograph to hand in the construction of her own image. Just as Irish women participated in the Irish citizen army, North Vietnamese women were enlisted and fought in the combat zone. This history does not exclude the fact, however, that Vietnamese women exist within a contemporary society that both empowers and disadvantages women through policies, cultural beliefs, and societal norms. Despite the abundant documentation of the Vietnamese refugee experience, Vietnamese women refugees have traditionally remained silent. Many factors have contributed to this, including the sublimation of individual identity, and in particular, female identity, within a society that favours the collective. As the Irish Independent newspaper revealed in 2013, Ireland ranks 25th out of 27 countries for female political representation, and just 26 of Ireland's 166 elected represent representatives are female. <clears throat> A history, any history, which represents the women of Ireland and Vietnam over the last 100 years is a contradictory one. The lives of women during this time hinge upon the lives of the women that preceded them. Very often, the images of Albert Kahn's archive tell us more about the women and men that came before than the women and men that they were about to become. Kahn's utopian goal was the preservation of peace and the furtherance of mutual understanding between nations. He espoused the theory that to know each other better was to understand each other better. 
For Khan, it then follows that this knowledge and understanding would help to prevent us from waging war upon one another. He was intent upon capturing traditional ways of life before they were wiped out by modernization, in fact, by globalization before the term itself was even invented. In this way, not only was the archive interested in furthering understanding between nations, it was also directed towards furthering understanding between generations. The history of the Albert Khan archive itself is rife with contradictions. For indeed, as Paula Ahmad has argued, the archive failed in its utopian objectives because of its inaccessibility to the wider population. Khan's films and autochromes were disseminated in a very controlled way, screened at his home, now the site of the Albert Khan Museum, to his friends and to members of Society Autour du Monde, which was a society which took people around the world. This was in the pursuit of intercultural cooperation and knowledge. As such, the films and autochromes were made available to an elite, select, educated audience and would not have been, in fact have been viewed by the many people featured in the actual films and autochromes themselves. No doubt the effect of these films on such enlightened and scholarly minds was positive and served in turn to enlighten and educate their students towards richer cultural understanding between nations. This is noble, but in some ways elitist, and in some respects may be viewed as educating the educated and potentially only reinforcing existing ideas held within their liberal minds. Conversely, it may be argued that because these films were never made public to a fee-paying audience, they were never digested as part of an overriding culture which sought to promote the positive nature of the French civilizing mission. In the same year that Louis Lumiere invented the, port the portable motion picture camera, France established the Mission Civilitrice as official government policy. Alice B. Conklin defines the civilizing mission as an attempt to, quote, transform ancient cultures into modern ones with modern subjects according to policies formulated at home, unquote. Unlike these films, which were organized by the government as a powerful ally in the representation and dissemination of the ideals and outcomes of the French civilizing mission, Cannes films were never screened commercially and were never used in this way as a kind of propaganda. Interestingly, in the context of his work, Albert Kahn was a shy, reclusive individual. Only one professional photograph can be found of him, and there are only some suggestions in others of him in the background of some of the images that he commissioned. There is a certain air of mystery around the man himself, which attaches himself to some of his auteurs de monde. Marguerite Mespillet, the main author of the photograph from Ireland, with Mignon serving as her assistant, has in fact been difficult to locate. I was able to purchase a copy of her rare book, published in 1913, entitled Creators of Wonderland, a literary criticism of Alice in Wonderland and its accompanying illustrations. And as this presentation reveals, I have been lucky enough to retrieve biographical information from Wellesley College and Columbia University in the United States. These institutions hold records of her academic and professional life as a teacher, um, but hold little reference to her time as a photographer in Ireland. <clears throat> Most of the articles published in the Irish press between 1913 and 1981 refer to the photographers as Messieurs Mespillet and Mignon. The general assumption of the Irish Times, the Irish press and the Connacht Sentinel was that the photographers were in fact men and this uh, sustained itself for quite a long period of time. It might be assumed that travelling throughout Ireland in 1913 with a large format autochrome camera that these two Parisian women would have made quite a striking pair. It seems, in fact, that the opposite was true. Their presence seems unremarkable and unremarked upon. Their photographic journey appears to have been unobtrusive in nature. This may go some way towards explaining the quiet connection that they made with the private and guarded women of the west of Ireland. Born in Paris on the 2nd of, of December, 1880, Marguerite Mespillet was 33 when she traveled to Ireland in May of 1913. Ireland at this time would have been a place of great political, social and cultural unrest. Radio Telefigeren, the national broadcaster in Ireland, 
have a project entitled The Century Ireland Project, an online historical newspaper providing some insight into life in Ireland in 1913. It tells us that in April 19, the Abbey Theatre staged a one-act drama by George Fosmaris. In the play, the character Jamani Shanahan describes his experience of life in rural Kerry, Kerry as, quote, the same old thing every day. This is an ugly spot and the people ignorant, grumpy and savage, unquote. A closer look at the events of 1913 alone reveal a society that Dr. Will Murphy describes as populated by, quote, people animated by contested ideas and ambitions, changing economic and social conditions, vibrant popular cultures, and an increasingly polarized politics. This period in Irish history saw women from all walks of life campaign for the freedom of women and Ireland as a nation. Their involvement in movements from Common Amon to the Irish Literary Revival revealed the overlapping agendas that unite cultural, so social and political revolution. Such women reflect a society with women revolutionaries at its core. <clears throat> Indeed, my own name, Alva Graney, or Alva Negroni in Irish, um, translated again as Alva, daughter of Grainne, it reveals a clue to my own rebellious ancestry. In Thuriocht Dyrmad Agus Grainne, uh, the pursuit of Dyrmad Agus Grainne, the theme is, as Dr. Miles Dillon has said, quote, the tragedy of a young girl betrothed to an old man, Finn, and of the conflict between passion and duty on the part of her lover, Dyrmad. In this case, death is the price of love, unquote. In one version of the story, following Grainne's elopement with, Deirdre, with Dyrmad, her younger sister, Alva, is wooed and won by Finn. And so my own name reflects some of the dualities inherent within the narrative of women's history. On the one hand, we have the rebellion of Grainne, and on the other, we have what might be interpreted as the submission of Alva to convention and authority. <clears throat> the strength of women as they fought for independence only highlights the contradictions inherent within the, na the narrative of Irish women's lives. As Maria Luddy makes clear, quote, the War of Independence, the creation of, North, of the Northern Ireland state, the signing of the treaty and the ensuing civil war created new Irelands in which women found themselves operating in a different political climate, a climate which remained fundamentally hostile to them in the fight for recognition of their rights. Within such a context, it is my opinion that Methbillet's representation of Irish women from the west of Ireland provide a visual for the kind of quiet strength inherent within Irish women living during such a time of political and social upheaval. Mespillet came to Ireland from France, a country with no political association or agenda with regard to Ireland. That is not to say, however, that France as a nation did not hold certain preconceived notions about the country. Whilst relations between France and Britain were good in the 19th century, a certain rivalry still existed. Therefore, a French romantic notion of the noble Irish savage living at the edge of Europe prevailed in the public consciousness with Britain as the villain. French travel writers set the scene for French interpretations of Irish life. The landscapes conjured up by one travel writer, Jean-Joseph Prévost, in Antour en Orlande, are those promoted by the romantic movement which swept through Europe at the time. Wild nature, tumultuous cloud formations, cascading streams, lofty cliffs and ruins, ruins and still more ruins. Painters from both within and outside Ireland were also contributing to this nar narrative, descending as they were upon Ireland, and in particular, the west of Ireland, seen and perceived at that time as representing um, a maybe pure, authentic uh, visualisation of the Irish people. Such is the climate that Mespillet and Madeleine would have uh, entered. Mespillet was a teacher herself, and Mignon were, um, herself and Mignon were laureates of the aggregation, a highly selective and prestigious competitive exam that qualifies young people to teach. Very few women took this exam in the early years of the 20th century. Um, Mespillet and Mignon can therefore be considered to have been members of the French intellectual elite. As such, we can only assume that their education would have led them to hold certain romantic notions within their consciousness regarding Ireland and her people. Catherine Magnon suggests the extreme likelihood of them having read Marianne de Beauvais' illustrated travel diary, first published in 1889 and republished in 1908. 
Mesfolo's images were first exhibited in Ireland on the initiative of the French Embassy and the Alliance Francaise in 1981. In 2007, when the images were exhibited at the Galway City Museum, curator Fidelma Milan highlighted that, quote, the exhibition must be viewed in the context of developments within the discipline of geography in France, unquote. In the new discipline of human geography, the geographer, by observing and analysing the patterns of human activity, could define cultural and geographical areas. Mespelé reflected these theories by focusing on more traditional settlements to embody a disappearing way of life. As such, she would not have photographed the types of revolutionary women previously highlighted in this presentation. At face value, there are no revolutionaries here. The women of Mespelé's archive embody a social and economic history often neglected in favour of a male-dominated political history. Mespelé's women of the West of Ireland are the poor working women of Ireland. It is these women that she choose, chooses to focus on. For while there are images of the landscape, of mountains, of ruins, of men at work and at rest, the collection focuses on women in a more sustained manner than any other people or place represented. The women she focuses on are predominantly from one area, the Clada. The area of the Clada, which sits just on the edge of Galway City proper, was a particular place close to an urban centre, but physically and metaphorically separated from the city of Galway by the apparent separateness of its Irish-speaking inhabitants. As Callie Blackman in Colouring the Clada has observed, it was frequently described as a place apart. These would have been private women, the community insular. Marriage was between people of the Clada, Connemara and the Aran Islands. Even Galway was seen as somewhat alien. The entrance to the Clada was at Wolftone Bridge, and no entry by an unknown quantity ever went unnoticed. Um, I've tried to map out to some extent the location of where the images were taken, which was at a gable end of a house um, at the edge of the big grass, um, which lies at the edge um, of the settlement in the Clada. Um, and interestingly, the family um, of some of the women um, lived just about five minutes from where I'm from in Galway. So they very kindly took me to where the images were physically taken down to minute detail where um, uh, the great grandson has matched uh, a brick in the wall to um, another image of a brick in the same wall that then identifies it as this specific place. Um, Catherine uh, Magnon, in her article, Reimagining Ireland, uh, through early 20th century French eyes, gives Mespillet no credit for overcoming what has been noticed, noted as the shyness of the people of the Clada. She suggests that the local people's existing fam familiarity with travel writers, artists, and photographers would have lessened this shyness when encountered by Mespillet. She regards Mespillet as condescending in her diary entries and condemns the way in which Mespillet, quote, cheated the shy women into posing and keeping quiet by telling stories and jokes. Unquote. Mas Magnon goes on to write that, uh, quote, Madame Mespillet did not treat the people she met as her equals. She behaved as a charitable outsider who felt for the natives she had come to examine. Uh, Magnon uh, criticizes the physical descriptions made by Mespillet in her diary. She links them to the study of phrenology that the French ladies co um, contributed to the work. Uh, to, and uh, um, that they contributed to the, to the dialogue established by Adolphe um, to conquer the visible world and connect the local with the global by drawing up a new inventory of the real in the shape of archives. <clears throat> Magnon may be correct in criticising the photographer's predisposition towards the ruin and the easy lyrical interpretation of the landscapes based upon pre-existing research of travel writers. There is a brevity to the collection of Irish photographs and an inconsistency of location and subject which reveals that the photographers may not have been as, as knowledgeable as they could have been whilst creating an archive of Ireland. In this respect, the work created in Ireland functions as a flawed, incomplete, disparate record of, or archive of a place. What stands out, however, are the representations of women made by women, not adequately, adequately defined as coming from different nations, but more meaningfully coming from different states of modernity, fractured by separate nationalist agendas. In my opinion, the photographs taken by Mespillet are clear and direct. The women look into the camera with a gaze that is unflinching. 
The red of the cloak adds a performative element to the images and ties in with paintings created before and after these photographs were made. The dramatic presence of red in the landscape creates a, an effect which seems contrived and potentially artificial. The cloak in the images by Mespele belonged to the O'Toole family and was only used on special occasions. It can be read as such, passed from photograph to photograph, as it is on this special occasion. Mespele, in her text, in fact, suggests that this cloak would have fallen out of fashion by 1913 and therefore was little used, confirming the contrived nature of its presentation in these images. The images of the women posed in the cloak direct us to look more closely at the images where the cloak is absent. These are the women at work and suggest more powerfully to us the behind-the-scenes narrative of the everyday. Here the elusive muted colours of workaday dress prompt us to a more nuanced reading of their lives. While muted in contrast to the vibrancy of the red, the colour revealed within this dress, absent from black and white photographic render renderings, is that of the landscape that surrounds these women. The soft greys and browns and blues speak to the surrounding landscape, in effect, to the surrounding landscape of labour. As Blackwell points out, blue and not red was the colour of the cloak that had been identified uh, with a woman of the Clada for centuries. It was the country women who came into Galway from the outside, from surrounding areas to sell produce, who wore the red hooded cloak, sometimes referred to as the Galway cloak. So while, whilst working with certain preconceived ideas in relation to the Irish Colleen, Mespile creates images that actually banish this term to a romantic, fictionalised past. The inclusion of physical descriptions that point to the descendants of Spanish settlers acknowledges a society that is not so insular or monocultural as it might first appear. Whilst reference to fair-skinned true Irish Celts may be naive, and the influence of Spanish settlers more likely have to be located within Galway and not the closed community of the Clada, this dialogue opens up a narrative that negate, negates the idea of, of a pure authentic race. The images of me and Kelly, her mother, and fellow clad women are not idealised. The fabric of their character, of their environment, of their work is in fact a relief from such notions. It reveals uh, the strength of these women and the way in which they controlled to a great extent their environment um, and had incredible leadership qualities in their uh, role as fishwives, selling and controlling the commerce of the fish industry within the area of Galway or, and the area of the Clada as, as it integrated into the city of Galway in the selling of the fish at the markets. Um, Mespile went on to become a founding member of the French Association of University Women and between 1926 and 29 she was vice president of the International Federation of University Women. This is not surprising when one looks back to her brief sojourn as a photographer in the west of Ireland. <clears throat> no doubt this project served as an, an adventure for Mespile and Mignon. They were not professional photographers and whilst operating within certain romantic ideals as well as particular objectives of the Albert Kahn archive, they were independent enough to perform under their own auspices. While some of the images of the Clada fulfilled the objectives of the Cannes archive, there was no requirement to develop such a series of women when one or two studies or one or two types might have sufficed. Mespillet individualised the women of the Clada, where previously they had been represented as observed elements within a curious and rare social context. These women have been named and identified, and their legacy and life journey is now possible to trace as part of a public consciousness that acknowledges the individual, social and economic history of such women. Rather poignantly, this fragment of a photograph um, up in the top corner is the only photograph that Mian and Peg, the daughters of Nan and Michael O'Toole, have of their father. The photograph, taken by a now unknown photographer, has become integrated into the fabric of these women's lives. Like the female characters in the plays of John Millington Singh, who made his own photographic images of Galway, Mespillet's women are more clearly defined than most of the men, but are also treated with the sympathetic complexity and that frequently determines the plot, mood and theme. Mespillet's images of women from the Clada mark both herself and her subjects as authors in their own right. Again, at face value, there are no revolutionaries archived in the collection of autochromes made by Leon Boussy in Vietnam and the rest of Indochina between 1914 and 1917. The scale of his archive renders the Irish archive a short story to his novel. 
The use of the term novel here is not to suggest that the images created by Ruthie were fictions. They were, however, like the images of Mespelet, a particular perspective, shaped by their author as much by the agenda of the archives commissioner. In 1915, at the start of World War I, Vietnam was part of French Indochina. Rebellions against the French colonial power intensified after, during and after World War I. As with the images of Ireland, however, the archive is defined as much by what is absent as by what is present. The images of Vietnam present a culture untouched by the colonial presence, unaltered by political strife and conflict. In sending Leon Boussy, a French military officer, to photograph the unindustrialized everyday life of the Vietnamese people, we cannot escape the thought expressed by Paula Mad that, quote, the planetary ambitions of Cannes archive were underwritten by French national ideals, unquote. Ahmad goes further in suggesting that the archives of the planet might more correctly be called the archives of the French colonial planet. Boussy departed for Hanoi on the 12th of July 1914, less than a month before the German invasion of Belgium. This was Boussy's fifth posting to Indochina, and he volunteered to take pictures for the archive, writing to Jean Brunes, who was the head of the archive just a few weeks before. A keen amateur photographer, Boussy was awarded first prize by the prestigious Société Française de Photographie. Boussy, um, as, a, as a Sioux intended militaire, Boussy would not have been involved in any direct aggression. Rather, his main responsibilities would have resided over logistics and supply. As such, he devoted much of his attention to photographic endeavours. While some influence in the form of um, colonial architecture creeps into the archive, there is little that acknowledges a French or military presence. His focus, as David Okofina observes, is dress, working lives, leisure activities, religious practices, gastronomic conventions, and social hierarchies of Vietnam and its people. This might be read as adhering to the agenda of the archive and its mission to distill daily lives of Vietnamese people. Creed and Horn suggest that, just as with the red cloak and the images of Ireland, there is an element of pretense here. Quote, the images point to a time when there was no need to record rituals of daily life because they were still living traditions, unquote. Widely observed within the archive is the domination of Boosie's lingering look at the women of Vietnam. Boosie's technical ability and obvious photographic talents in the representation of these women have garnered him praise and disdain in equal measure. While the images of Ireland similarly failed to reflect upon colonial influences and aggressions, this did not hold true for the entire archive. In 1913, during the Balkans War, Brunet himself and Auguste Lyon carried cameras into sites of battle. The archives of the planet were also present in the French army camps of the First World War. Not only did they photograph French soldiers and the detrimental consequences of war, they also photographed troops from North Africa and Indochina. Absent of such content, it is not hard to see um, why Ahmad would describe the work, uh, Leon Boussy's work, as some of the most aesthetically stylized and pol politically muted films in the archive. His focus on rural stability and upon objectifying the physical characteristics of Vietnamese women reveals an invasive colonial agenda. Film historians such as Ahmad have noted the lack of critical writing on the Albert Kahn archive. Rarer still are critical accounts from a still photographic perspective. While Ahmad's critique of Boosie's moving images may be transferred to many of the autochromes, the collection is still wanting of a fuller photographic inspection. Creed and Horn, in a similar way to Okafina, focus on a film entitled Scene de Dehabillage, Tonkin, 1921. The images in this presentation are stills drawn from the film. And as with all of the films, this is an unedited black and white sequence. Such raw glimpses of life embody the archive's film collection. They very often focus on everyday activities and are uninterpreted scenes representing an immediate social situation. In this instance, the situation is a young Vietnamese woman undressing and dressing before the camera. The film is deliberately shot out of focus, <clears throat> And where it is sometimes compared to an Edward Muybridge study of the human body in motion, it is impossible to read this in terms of its out-of-focus structure. Clearly, Boosie filmed the, film, filmed the scene this way to prevent a pornographic reading. To a postmodern eye, however, it seems to have exactly the opposite effect. When viewed in the context of the volume of lush photographic depictions of women within the archive, it is difficult not to read it as some kind of appreciation or homage to the female form rather than a scientific study of it. 
However, it is the woman herself who draws this film back from the brink. Unlike Hollywood films, where voyeurism is hidden by the actor's refusal to acknowledge the camera, the subject in these early films more often than not look into the camera, addressing both the filmmaker and the viewer. An examination of the gaze in most cases renders it voyeuristic and invasive. The subject's returned gaze here serving only to highlight this. <clears throat> However, with this subject, the woman returns the gaze and as such asserts herself as present. She is in this way identifying herself as author. This direct gaze and upright proud posture is evident of some of the autochrome portraits held within the archive. These images are not within the public domain, however, and can only be viewed on site at the Albert Kahn archive. Like Mespillet, Busey would have produced his images with certain romantic ideas regarding Vietnam, its place, and its people. In the 19th century, French, artists, in French artistic influences began to take hold in Vietnam, and as such, Busey is victim to the same kind of romantic lore put forward by painters and writers of the time. It is these kind of romantic depictions which dominate the archive. Okay, sorry. And which, um, uh, regarding the archive, uh, my apologies, I've, I've gone uh, really over time. Um, so I'll just move quickly through to conclude. Um, um, some of these images were produced post the Leon Boosie's images, um, but reflect the, the dominant sort of romantic perspective as, and the lingering uh, look of Boosie over the images. Um, these are some images that do not exist within the public realm and which present the women um, as strong independent characters in their own right um, and where they begin in a, in a subtle way to take ownership of their representation. Um, and this relates to the history again of Vietnam um, and the strength of women within their political uh, history of conflict. The long-haired warrior um, was a, 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 another sort of image that prevailed in the public consciousness in, in a romantic sense um, and in some ways potentially uh, further aestheticize their look. Um, and so to conclude, um, I will just very briefly um, look to some of my images uh, which were inspired or drawn out of um, my research um, within the archive um, and uh, which, which, which attempts to put in place and put back um, a certain kind of um, uh, fabric um, in terms of um, these women's lives. And this work will be shown um, in Parry Photo uh, next week, so there'll be additional images that you can, you can come and see. They were drawn from um, um, the idea of the women moving within the landscape as a, a kind of moving garden um, carrying the, the, the contemporary dress, which which, which represents a kind of a forward motion and a look to the future in terms of how women move through society and reveal themselves um, in a landscape that might be fractured but is still um, strong and intact. Um, so thank you and I apologise for going so much over time. Thanks.